In our next lesson on transcription and RNA, we want to consider the LAC operon just briefly. You may have considered the, the study of this operon in other courses and considered it more particularly. We're just going to look briefly at its negative regulation. There are other aspects to its regulation we will not consider. The LAC operon functions in E. coli and other bacteria. The term operon refers to multiple genes that are transcribed from a single promoter, an operator region. All of the genes are transcribed together. In other words, they are all expressed, or they're none expressed, or they're all expressed to the same level. This is a very common theme in prokaryotic systems. These operons often involve genes associated with metabolic pathways, so you either need all of the genes in that pathway or none of them. We don't see this type of an arrangement of operons in eukaryotic systems. Instead, our genes are transcribed and regulated in other ways as we saw in our previous lesson. In this case, the LAC operon contains three structural genes as illustrated in our figure at the bottom of the screen here, LAC-Z, LAC-Y, and LAC-A. We'll look at the function of those in just a moment. You'll notice upstream of the structural genes is an operator region in blue. Upstream of that is the promoter region in green. This would be the region of DNA to which DNA RNA polymerase binds to transcribe the operon. Upstream of the promoter region is LAC-I, the gene that encodes the LAC repressor. Let's see how these elements function together. The LAC-Z gene encodes beta-galactosidase, the enzyme that hydrolyzes lactose to produce galactose and glucose, which can then be metabolized for energy. You'll notice in the figure at the bottom right, lactose is a beta-1-4 linkage of galactose and glucose, hence the name beta-galactosidase. The LAC-Y gene encodes lactose permease, which is a kind of lactose transporter. It brings lactose within the cell so that it can then be processed by beta-galactosidase. The LAC-A gene encodes thiogalactoside transacetylase, and although we know its catalytic function, its role in the operon is unclear because the gene can be deleted and lactose is still processed properly. So if we look again at the operon on the lower left, you'll notice that the operator region is upstream of the structural genes, but downstream of the promoter. So if there's anything that binds to this operator region, it will block RNA polymerase either from binding to the promoter or from proceeding through to transcribe the gene. The LAC-I protein is expressed from the LAC-I gene. It's actually a tetramer repressor protein, and that's in our space filling model here. The tetramer of the LAC-I protein is shown in blue, green, and the two shades of pink, and it binds to the operator region of the DNA pictured in purple. It blocks the sigma factor of RNA polymerase from binding the promoter and shuts down transcription. LAC-I is always present, so the default condition of the operon is off. In other words, why express the genes if we have no lactose to process? So the question is, how do we turn the operon on? The repressor responds to the presence of lactose. One of the side products of beta-galactosidase is allolactose, pictured at the bottom of the screen here. A portion of the time, beta-galactosidase will hydrolyze the bond between galactose and glucose, but then it will reform the link between two different carbons, between carbon-1 and carbon-6, and that produces allolactose. Allolactose binds to the repressor, and that changes its affinity for that operator region. So the repressor falls off the operator, and now RNA polymerase can bind and express the, gene, the structural genes in the operator and the operon. We refer to this as an inducible promoter. The default condition is off, but we can induce expression by the presence of the indu inducer allolactose. In our next video lesson, we want to look at the general structure of RNA polymerase and compare that to the structure of DNA polymerase.